All right, and welcome to the first micro lecture uh, for the second part of American Literature Survey. Um, again, as I've said in class, and for those of you who've had uh, the earlier version of this class last semester know, uh, the idea behind these very short uh, little videos is to provide you all with some factual uh, historical information um, about the literary movement and also the historical period in which that movement takes place um, to help provide you with some context for our class discussions and for your own analysis. So, uh, listen up, uh, pay attention, and be thinking about how some of this stuff fits in with what we're reading and talking about in class. So, we're starting off the semester, obviously, uh, really here with realism. We've spent a little bit of time this semester so far, talking about the local color movement. Um, and again, real quickly, the local color movement was an idea about uh, presenting the uniqueness of these small little societies, cultures <clears throat> around the country to readers in different parts of the country who are never going to uh, interact with or experience them for themselves. Um, and the real idea there was to just simply accurately represent that unique spot of the country. Um, and realism really grows out of that and just basically moves into a much larger, more expansive uh, scope. So that instead of worrying about the specificity of a, specific, of a region, um, it's much more interested in accurately presenting the reality of whatever world it's describing. Um, <clears throat> all this is going on at a fairly unique uh, time in America, uh, starting about 1875 or so. We're coming out um, of the Reconstruction. We're about 10 years out from the American, the end of the Civil War. Um, and by about 1875, uh, most people have accepted the absolute failure of uh, Reconstruction. Um, the South was devastated by the war, both economically and uh, physically. Um, Reconstruction was supposedly an attempt to uh, address that, um, but uh, for a variety of reasons, it was uh, pretty much a complete disaster. Um, this is also taking place, though, at a time of great technological change. So we've got a variety of new advances that are really changing the way we understand and think about the world. You can see just a few of them right here. Um, these are all advances that would ultimately shape the 21st century, the 20th century, excuse me, as, as we've come to know it. Uh, and so it's a time of great uh, change in the United States, but not only technological change, but also social and political change. Uh, one of the greatest social changes that takes place um, at this point in time is the passage of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, uh, which was an attempt to uh, finally rectify the false notion uh, that African Americans were not fully uh, essentially human, um, as was uh, dictated by the southern states in order to justify slavery. Um, interestingly, though, the 14th Amendment was passed in order to uh, help human beings, specifically um, in terms of race, but it ultimately became a tool of the corporations. Um, <clears throat> I think by about 1890 or so, there had been something like 20 cases dealing with African Americans. Um, trying to justify their uh, position in society through the 14th Amendment, while there had been something like over 200 cases of corporations trying to justify their uh, place within society as individuals uh, based on the same amendment. Uh, and this is something we still see today with things like Citizens United uh, that was uh, in, has been in the news uh, so much recently. Um, and the idea of corporate personhood um, giving human rights, essentially, American civil rights, uh, to corporations. Other great changes that are taking place are situations, um, a lot of labor unrest. Um, this is a time when uh, <clears throat> the 
working class uh, is becoming more and more aware of the disparities in society. Um, and so you start to see a lot of labor disputes. Um, some people would call them riots. Other people would call them massacres. Um, <clears throat> with people trying to uh, figure out the balance between what some people are paid and what other people are paid. Um, and again, this is something we still absolutely see today with uh, the growing disparity between the working class and the middle class um, <clears throat> and the 1% as, as we refer to them these days. A lot of this uh, comes about as a result of the publication and distribution of the Communist Manifesto in 1886 by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, um, which lays the foundation for the socialist movement um, as we see it develop and uh, grow throughout uh, the late 19th and the entirety of the 20th century. But it's also the time of what we now talk about as the robber barons um, or the titans of industry, depending on which way you want to think about them. Uh, these are people whose names today are still synonymous with uh, extreme wealth. Uh, today we think about these names often in terms of uh, uh, philanthropy, <clears throat> but back then they were the men who were making massive fortunes uh, through often rather dubious and questionable practices. So we move into this uh, American society around 18... 75 or so, really, um, up through about 1900, about the turn of the century, uh, with this idea of uh, artistic realism, not just literary realism, but we see it in the arts um, as well. Um, and at the core, realism, whether it's about art or painting or drawing, is an attempt, once again, simply to honestly and accurately um, some would say even objectively, represent uh, reality as we see it. At its core is of an idea of verisimilitude, just one of those fancy literary terms, uh, which just essentially deals with the accuracy of reality, uh, capturing something as really as possible. One thing to think about is the fact that photography is rapidly developing at this time. Uh, and so painting is being compared to and matched up with this new technology which actually does capture reality. Um, and so those ideas become mixed um, and art attempts to do the same thing that the camera does. In terms of literary realism. We've seen a lot of these already through local color and they become slightly more expansive uh, through the literary realist uh, movement. A greater emphasis on daily life, uh, what some would call the experienced commonplace. Um, things are drawn from our own unique daily experiences, not from fancy, not from uh, some otherworldly uh, sense of things. Uh, plots are often fairly simple and emphasize, again, the norms of daily existence. Um, diction and dialect are also natural. They're not poetic. They're not fantastic. Um, they are attempts to accurately represent the way people speak. Um, character becomes significantly more important in plot. We saw with local color the character ultimately wasn't too terribly important. The character of the place was more important than the character of the individuals. Uh, realism shifts that focus um, and places the greatest emphasis on the character of the individual. What they do is, is not so important as how they think about those things. Realism is also a very anti-romantic idea, almost to the point of being non-transcendental. Um, writing is an attempt to instruct and entertain, but never to enlighten. Realism also focuses on morality as something that is self-realized. Um, and ultimately, the realists, much like the romantics before them, saw themselves as 
a demonstration of or an expression of democracy. Um, but you can imagine kind of the two different ways they, they come to that decision. Um, the realists place great emphasis on the presentation of the physical and a limitation on authorial commentary. And ultimately, you can think about that as a limitation on authority itself, which again is something that is central to democracy. Um, realists place a great value on complete authorial objectivity. They're reporters, much more so than commentators. So that's where we're really at with literary realism. We're taking a look at some of the work of Mark Twain with his most famous writing, Huck Finn. Um, <clears throat> that was just one of many books of his as well. Um, these are a few of the other uh, well-known realists, although it's only a very small sampling of a very large uh, and assorted collection of authors as well. So I'll be thinking about these things as you're working your way through Huck Finn and as we're starting to talk about these things in class. Um, and just to kind of close things off here today, here's kind of a final question I'd like you to be thinking a little bit about. And if you'd like a little extra credit, you can go on to Blackboard afterwards and post a response uh, to this question. Um, not something that has a right or wrong answer, but simply something I'd like you to, to think a little bit about. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of realism, uh, and an attempt to accurately represent the reality um, in which the story is taking place. Uh, what significance might we find when we consider that Twain, a Southerner, wrote Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, a story set before the Civil War, after the failure of the post-war Reconstruction?